Hello. Today I'd like to give you a brief tour about machine learning tasks. The contents I'm going to talk about today mostly come from this textbook, Mathematics for Machine Learning. There are three major components of machine learning, data, models, and learning. I'll only very briefly cover what we think of as data for machine learning and spend most of this time today talking about models. I'm actually not going to tell you anything about learning at all. So here's some data. Uh, each row is data about a particular person, um, pretend to be an employee, and this person has different features such as their gender, the degree they have, their postcode. Okay. Now, the first thing about machine learning is that it doesn't work very well when the data is not in a numerical format. So the first thing we do when we have data is to convert it into a numerical format. Now, to do so often includes very uh, specific domain knowledge. For example, we know that degrees essentially progress from a bachelor degree to a master's degree to a PhD. Uh, we also know that postcodes, for example, are not just a random string of characters. They actually mean a particular location in London. So using this kind of domain knowledge, we can convert this kind of data set into a numerical one. Okay. Here, we have converted the degree into the different levels of bachelor, master's, and PhDs. And I've split the postcode into the actual longitude and latitude location itself on Earth. Now, once we have data as numbers, we, we can get to machine learning. Essentially, each data point, each row in this table can be represented as a vector. So this is a vector of real numbers. So today I will tell you very briefly about the, the four pillars of machine learning, two supervised and two unsupervised. For supervised learning, we define the input space. And as I said earlier, we think of data as a vector. So this is a vector in, in, the, in RD, so where D is the D dimensions that we're looking at. So for example, in that table, the dimensions could be five. And remember, the input space is always converted into numbers, so these are real numbers. Okay, and once we've defined what the output space is, and I'll come to that in a little while, we want to find a function, so machine learning, is about finding a function that takes you from x to y. So it takes you from a function that takes you from the real data that you've seen into the output or the outcome that you're really interested in. So for example, in regression, the input, as we know, is a real value vector, but the output y is just a single number, okay, a real value scalar. For example, if we take the data that we have from that table we had and we plot it, so here we plot uh, on the x-axis the person's age and on the y-axis the person's salary. If we plot each of those five rows as one single blue dot, we get a plot as follows. So each of the five dots there is a single data point. Well, two features of that single data point. Okay. So now let's say the regression task here is to predict the salary of a person from the person's age. So the input to the predictor is the person's age and the output of the predictor is the person's salary. Our training data consists of pairs of age and salary. And this is the data you see plotted here. Now we take this training data and we do machine learning find some way to fit the model. Okay. What's important though, is that we're not actually interested in the data points that we have here. What we're interested in is to predict the salary of a person of an age that we haven't seen before. For example, in the plot, we, we want to see what the value of the salary is if the person has age 60. So that was regression. Now, 
For binary classification, this is the other supervised learning algorithm. The input stays the same. It's still a real value vector. But output, instead of being a real number, is now a binary outcome. So it only has two possible values. Now, because on computers, we still have to represent them as numbers, we usually represent these binary outcomes as 0 or 1, representing true and false, or we represent them as plus 1, minus 1, positive or negative. Because we have converted from a real-valued outcome to a binary outcome, it turns out that the algorithms that do binary classification are different from the algorithms that do regression. I'm not going to cover what that is today, but I want to point out something particularly important about classification. As I warned earlier, there are usually different ideas in machine learning which have the same name. So in this particular case, remember, the classifier f takes us from the input data, the real value vector, to the outcome or the output that we care about. In this case, 0, 1, or plus 1, minus 1. However, these classifiers can also have other uh, functions, okay? And for the same task of binary classification. We can think of this classifier and decompose it into three pieces. Okay. At the most inner part of this classifier, we have a scoring system, okay? Something that takes the data point, the input vector x, does weighted averaging of this data point and computes a score, okay? And when you say machine learning, and when you say training, you mean to find a good parameter vector theta. Okay? So once we've computed this score, this score is a real number. In some sense, it's very much like a regressor. However, to convert from that score, often we want to pass this score through something called an inverse link function. So those of you who know statistics might know what that is. When you pass it through an inverse link function, for example, a sigmoid, you get something which is essentially the class probability. So in other words, once you take a score and pass it through the inverse link function, you end up with the probability of the outcome being positive. Okay, That's called the class probability. Given this class probability, we can take a threshold. And very often, we take the classifier output and you need to make some sort of decision. And for example, we might want to make a threshold at 0 0.5. So if the class probability is greater than 0 0.5, we call that point positive. So I hope you, you pay attention to exactly what the different classifiers are. So why are there two supervised learning tasks? Assume we have this input space x. And this is always in a vector of dimension d. And we have two different output spaces. Okay? And the difference between regression and classification is that the, the output space y is either continuous or discrete. Okay? It seems like a very minor difference, but it turns out that continuous valued um, uh, outputs have a particular kind of, of representation and hence also different kinds of methods. So these two methods are qualitatively different. The mathematics that goes into them is qualitatively different. The algorithms that run them are qualitatively different. And in fact, you know, how we represent them on the computer is also qualitatively different. The other obvious question is, why only two? I mean, clearly not uh, all possible tasks can be put in this way. But it turns out that once you've mastered these two uh, basic types of machine learning, supervised machine learning tasks, you can, uh, you can also attack other similar tasks using very similar methods. So tasks like uh, multi-class classification, multi-output classification, or structured prediction. I'm going to change gears quickly and talk about unsupervised learning. Okay. Unlike supervised learning, we don't have labels in unsupervised learning. So we're given some data x, which we again assume to be a vector, a d-dimensional vector, and we want to find some structure. Okay, The kinds of structure we want to ask is things like, where's the data clumped? Or can we summarize the features? 
in density estimation, the first of our two methods, we, we answer the question of where is the data clumped. We get using the inputs, which is a set of real value vectors, we want to output a probability density. The assumption here for density estimation is that the data is not uniformly distributed. In other words, you don't assume that the data is evenly spread everywhere in RD. You can think of densities, if you don't know what they are, as essentially histograms. Okay? In one dimension, histograms are relatively easy to compute, but in higher dimensions, so remember our real value vectors are, for example, in dimension five, it's actually quite hard to compute histograms and hence you need to do something more advanced. One tool that turns out to be surprisingly useful is Gaussian distributions. And in fact, most um, straightforward ways of doing density estimation either use Gaussian distributions or a combination of Gaussian mix distributions, a mixture of Gaussian distributions. Um, one last point about this is that clustering can also be thought of as density estimation. The other um, pillar of unsupervised learning is to do dimensional reductions, which is to try and answer the question, can we summarize the features? We have input, which is a high dimensional real valued vector, and from which we want to find a lower dimensional real valued vector. In this setting, we assume that the data lies in some sort of low dimensional space. So this is not unreasonable in some practical applications where data is often correlated to each other. You can think of this as this, this low dimensional surface, uh, this low dimensional vector as a surface in a higher dimensional space. So for example, a, a two dimensional surface in a three dimensional space. Uh, it turns out that Linear surfaces, flat surfaces, um, or their locally local versions of them are actually very useful. So a, a concrete example is that principal component analysis actually is just finding the best linear subspace. That's, that's all I have for today. Um, in summary, we have four pillars, which two are supervised learning and two unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, we looked at regression and classification. And this is due to the fact that the label space, the outputs that you want are either continuous or discrete. For unsupervised learning, we want to extract structure from the data without using labels. And density estimation studies essentially how clumpy the data is and dimensionality reduction studies looking helps you look for principal features of your data. Thank you very much for your attention.